Chapter 5 deals with work, energy, and power, and you'll see it's a good transition from the work we're doing with force, because we actually need these forces to, certainly, to calculate work, and, and we'll see how that relates to energy and power. We had a brainstorming session in class that looked something like this, where we brainstormed as many forms of energy as we can think of, and we looked at some relationships between them. So, generally speaking, we have, in Chapter 5, we're talking about mechanical forms of energies. We break it down into two general areas, kinetic energy, which we use a K or a KE, depending on the book you, you are actually using, and potential energy, which could be a capital U or a um, capital PE, depending which book you're using. When we're talking about kinetic energy, we have our linear motion and, and rotational motion. You can also think of thermal energy, which is heat, as is, is kinetic energy down at a molecular level or an atomic level, how fast are the atoms moving. And potential energy, you'll see in Chapter 5, we'll, we'll talk in particular about gravity and springs, but later on, in, later in the book, there are other forms of potential energy as well. We touched upon in our discussion um, chemical, electromagnetic, nuclear, and we discussed several methods of using these and transitions from one to another. So let's take a look at a few important energy equations we'll want to start using right off the bat. First of all, for kinetic energy, which is energy of motion, we use a variable, once again, K or KE, and it equals 1 half mv squared. And this is for linear motion. This could be velocity in your x, y, or z direction. You could calculate the energy in any one of those directions using this formula. Now, later on, we'll see a, another form of uh, motion energy, which relates to a rotating objects. So anytime you have something that's rotating, you'll also have an energy related to its rotational motion. And we already experimented a bit in class with the concept of rotational mass and how that um, inertia from an object uh, spinning does something different as, as the object moves. And later on we'll, we'll be able to explain those differences in motion using this equation. In physics we often want to find differences from your final values to your initial values, and so just like we have in, like with delta x or delta v, um, we will do the same thing for energy. Um, so delta k equals our final kinetic energy minus our initial kinetic energy. And if you're plugging our, that into our equation, it would just equal 1 half mv1 squared minus 1 half mv v naught squared. I'm sort of assuming here that your mass isn't changing along the way, but keep your eyes open for problems where you potentially have a change in your mass as well. From chapter 5 you'll see potential energy related to objects moving in a gravitational field and this is related to here on Earth. If you we're moving off Earth like we did with Newton's Law of Gravity we have to consider it a little bit differently but we'll talk about that later. For springs we will actually do a lab experiment and we will actually prove where this equation comes from. We'll drive it using your results of your lab experiment. Um, delta K, we can do delta U to calculate our change in potential energy, which is something we'll need to do later on. And it's just your final potential energy minus your initial potential energy. Here's an example using our gravitational potential energy. Later in the book, you'll find that there are many forms of potential energy, which we brainstormed during our brainstorming session. And you'll find that there's e equations for each one of those as well. And just to show you, there's a little pattern going here. We've got 1 half mv squared, 1 half i omega squared, we've got 1 half kx squared, we've got 1 half cv squared, we've got 1 half I, li squared for all these various forms of energy. One way to think about work is if we have um, a form of energy and we want to transition to another form of energy, for example, let's say that we wanted to take nuclear energy and turn it into electricity, well in between we need to do some work. And uh, by doing some work, we can uh, use that uh, work to transition from one form to another, to another, to another, to another. By using nuclear energy to boil water, we increase the speed of the atoms and uh, boil water, turn it into steam, pressurize a vessel, let that pressure difference go through a turbine, and it turns the turbine. The turbine now moves, and the turbine is connected to a generator. The generator now rotates, and then the generator creates electricity, which moves from one point to another using waves. And each one of those transitions requires work. And so work you use to convert energy from one form to another. And I state here that the work is done, the work W is done by a constant force. And it, actually it doesn't need to be a constant force. As we know about springs, springs don't have a constant force. But it is, it is done by any force acting on an object. 
and it's defined as the product of the component of the force along the direction of the displacement and the magnitude of the displacement. The units for work are the same as energy. And so we could use force times distance units, Newton meters, or here we've got, if we just convert these into MKS units, that's kilograms times meters squared over second squared. Of course, we also, as I mentioned before, in our introduction, we call those joules for MKS units, or our US customary version of those would be foot pounds. Work and energy are scalar quantities. They are not vectors. But um, they can have a positive or negative sign associated, and that would sort of indicate a flow of which way is the energy going into the system or out of the system, or is your work being done increasing the energy of the system or decreasing it. Simple equation for work is work equals force times distance, and we'll, we'll do some examples about this coming up next. Later on, we'll see that there's a, a more comprehensive equation that we'll be able to use, and this is called the vector dot product. This is called work equals force vector dotted with a displacement vector, and we'll explain later how that works. So let's take a look at work. Let's suppose I have a 20 kilogram box, and I'm going to apply a force to that box causing to move some distance. So let's just say the force is 50 newtons, and let's say the distance is 2.5 meters. The question is, what type of work is being done on this? There are some other forces, and right now I'm just going to look at the pushing force, but we might want to think about the frictional force as well. And so we're going to use our simple equation, and we can only use this, the simple equation if the forces are aligned. So we have the pushing force is going to the right, as is our displacement. Now the frictional force is also aligned with this, it's just in the opposite direction. So we've got a frictional force to the left and the distance to the right. Three of these vectors are aligned in the x direction. So to calculate our pushing work, all we have to do is work equals the pushing force times the distance, using our simple equation only that we can only use when all of our forces are aligned. And so we just take our 50 newtons times 2.5 meters and we get 125 joules. If we were to calculate the work done by friction, we would find that's a negative quantity. And I think it should be, if you think about it, um, I'm pushing the box to the right. Of course, what's working against me? Friction's working against me. And that against, I, I just said, is your negative quantity. And we'll talk a little bit more later mathematically why that happens when we look at the dot product. Work is a scalar quantity, but it can be positive or negative, as we mentioned before. Now we have a concrete example for each. And once again, if you just look at the dimensional analysis here, we've got the units for work are force units times distance units. And looking at SI, standard international MKS units, we've got newtons times meters, or we've got kilograms times meters squared per second squared, if you break out the newtons, which were named after this gentleman, James Jewell. All right, now let's take a look at an example with US units. I use similar US quantities here, a 40 pound box instead of a 20 kilogram box. We moved to about 8 feet rather than 2.5 meters and a pushing fo force of about 12 pounds rather than 50 newtons. And plugging in our numbers into our equations, we find that the work being done is our pushing force of 12 pounds times the distance we move is 8 feet. So we've got 8 times 12 is 96 pound feet, but typically we call these foot pounds. And once again, if we were calculating a frictional force on this. If we knew what that frictional force was, we could calculate the work being done against us as a negative quantity by friction. So our US customary units for work are foot-pounds. Now I'm going to leave it up to you, and please do this as a little side exercise. Um, please convert one foot-pound into joules to see what the conversion factor is for that, and you can go ahead and use your unit dimensional analysis to do that. And once again, uh, James Jewell, he actually defined the foot-pound. He used this as, a, as his standard reference qual uh, quantity. He said, all right, if we raise an object that weighs one pound by one foot, he defined that as the basic unit, and he called that economic duty is what he called it back in the day. He was actually the son of a, a brewer. They had a big brewing operation in Manchester, England. And he was a um, brilliant man. And at one point, they were using steam engines, and he did... Um, a lot of the work to convert his father's factories over to the new electric motors and did a lot of research to see economically which would be the better uh, method to use for their business to see which one would, would make more money for them. And as he did that, he did it in a very careful scientific manner and worked out all these ideas. And he's, he's credited with many different ideas. And here's one of his famous experiments that he did. He actually took this device that had a paddle with... Uh, 
something to turn the top of this with with blades put it in some, put it in a bucket of water and as you turn the water you should see the energy that you put into this and he used to energy of these falling objects to determine using gravitational potential energy um, if these objects were to fall and turn this blade you should see the energy from these objects being transferred to the energy of the water with no energy being lost and his idea really led to what we call the conservation of energy and so this is a, a, a and he also um, this then basically led to the first law of thermodynamics which you've probably studied in chemistry already okay so let's take a look at examples of calculating work and we're going to look at it a couple different ways. We're going to calculate the work for an object, um, but we're also going to look at the free body diagram. We'll actually do some calculations to see how fast it's going, and we can use that to calculate some kinetic energy changes. And finally, we cal we'll calculate the work done. Be sure to check your handout to make sure you're using the same numbers. as me. I may have tweaked the numbers a little bit to make them work nicely. So we're going to take a 15 kilogram block. We're going to move it two meters with a force of 100 newton, 10 newtons. The frictional surface does have a coefficient of kinetic friction of one-third. So let's go ahead and once again whenever we work on problems that have forces we should always start with the force uh, free body diagram. I'm going to define some directions here and of course I like to start with gravity. Uh, so we're going to take 15 kilograms times about 10 meters per second squared. You get 150 newtons downward. Of course, acting upward, we're going to have a normal force, and because we have no angled vectors in this problem, our normal force and our gravitational force will be equal and opposite, Newton's third law if you'd like, or Newton's second law, or Newton's first law for that matter. You could actually um, next put in the pulling force, we're going to use 110 Newtons, and we're going to calculate a frictional force, which is one-third of our 150 Newton normal force, which should give us 50 Newtons. This block will accelerate to the right. The question is by how much. We can apply Newton's second law. We can take the sum of the forces, divide by mass, and our forces that we have here, we've got a pulling force minus our fr frictional force, so 110 minus 50 is 60 Newtons, and then we'll divide that by the mass of 15 kilograms. We get 4 meters per second squared. All right, so now we have an acceleration. Let's use that acceleration, and let's use motion equation number 8, and we can actually crank out final velocity of the box after it's moved two meters and we find out it's four meters per second after after it's moved two meters with this constant force applied to it and actually we, if you'd like to we could also use equation number six or we could use equation number five six is a little bit easier to figure out the time it takes to do that and it only takes one second to move that distance okay now that we've found the velocity let's actually use it to do part two which is to calculate the blocks initial and final kinetic energy and of course Kinetic energy is just based on the velocity of an object. It's, it's a measure of, of the energy related to motion. And we have a simple little equation that we can plug into. Kinetic energy equals one-half mv squared. And it's really easy for the initial position because the block is not moving, so it has no kinetic energy. And as you can see, our kinetic energy initially is zero joules. And after we push it for two meters, our velocity is not four meters per second, and we've imparted energy to the box. That's what our work did. Our work created a new, new form of energy. If we do our little calculation here, Ke equals 1 half mv1 squared. The square of the force 16 and half of 16 is 8 times 15 is 120 joules. To figure out the change in kinetic energy, so delta K equals K1 minus K0. Easy math here. We've got 120 joules minus 0 joules, so our change in kinetic energy is positive 120 joules. So we've added 120 joules of energy to this box through our work that we did. Speaking of work, let's calculate how much work is done by each force on this box, and also let's calculate the net work. Now what we're going to do is we'll use that free body diagram once again, because we'll need that to calculate the work done. We're going to use our simple formula, work equals force times distance, if our force and distance displacement vectors are aligned, and they are in some cases here. And so let's take a look to see what we're going to do here for that. So we've got our free body diagram, and what I'll do is I'll organize things into a little table just so we can keep things organized here. And we have four forces that we're dealing with, a pulling force in the x direction, a uh, frictional force in the negative x direction, and we've got gravity and normal forces acting in the negative and positive y directions. 
Um, the distance that our pulling force went through was uh, 2 meters, as did our friction happened over 2 meters as well. So we can plug those into our equations and we can work out and we find out that we did a lot of work pulling the object and uh, that was a 220 joules of work that we did. And we could have been pushing it or pulling it, doesn't really matter which way we did it. And we also noticed that we can also see that friction did some work as well. It was working against us, so we have a negative sign. So we have negative 100 joules of work done by friction. The big question is, what about gravity? Did gravity do any work at all here? Did the box move up and down? No. So gravity didn't do any of the work in this situation. And so there was no work done in the y direction. In the same sense, the normal force, that's acting in the y direction as well, but there is no motion in the y direction. So gravity and normal force, they would like to take some credit for the work done, but they did nothing here. We did all the work, so let's take credit for it. We've got gravity and normal force actually provide no work for the situation. So let's go ahead and, and find the net work done, which is just the total of all the work. Just like we had a net force in the good old days, we have net work, which is the total of all the work elements. And our total is? 120 joules of energy. And if you look back, we had 120 joules was the change in kinetic energy. So that's really interesting. We've got our change in kinetic energy matches our net work done on the object. So let's take a look at some conclusions about work. First of all, work is done by any force acting parallel to the direction of the displacement. We can have work as positive or negative. It's positive if the force is, is aligned with the displacement vector, and it's negative if they are opposite directions. If the force acting is parallel to the displacement, for example, we were moving horizontally, but gravity is acting vertically, no work was done. It didn't move in that direction. The definition of net work is just like in the good old days with forces. We have the net forces, the total forces, or the resultant force, the same thing for work. The net work is just a sum of all the work done by each force acting on an object. So we go through step by force by force and figure out how much work each one is doing and add them up. We found out, it looks like, that the net work being done, and we'll do a couple more examples to prove this, or to give you a better idea at least, that the net work done on an object is going to equal the change in your kinetic energy done on the object, and that's called the work kinetic energy theorem. So this is a new way to find out velocity set. In the past, we had to use motion equations. We had to go through acceleration, perhaps figure out some time involved. But now we can, turns out, if we can calculate the work done on an object, you know, we still have to draw a free body diagram. If we can use the work calculations, total work, that equals the kinetic energy. We can figure out how much the kinetic energy has changed. And therefore, with a little bit of math, we can figure out the change in velocity. So we have this new equation called the work kinetic energy theorem which just states that the net work done on an object by all the forces acting on it equals the change in kinetic energy. So let's use it to solve a few problems. Now you'll notice these four problems, you could easily solve any of these problems using the methods we've developed using constant acceleration equations from chapters two and three. And this is actually chapter two because it's only one dimension, along with some free body diagrams to determine some of the forces. But we're going to do it a different way. We're going to use this new method, our work kinetic energy theorem, and we'll be able to find the same information. The only thing we won't be able to find, though, remember that energy doesn't give us any information about the time things happen. And we'd have to go back to motion equations if we wanted to find out times. So let's take a look at the first problem. How far does this box slide before its velocity drops down to 2 meters per second? All right. So the box is going to slide along some distance. That's the distance we would like to calculate. And the first thing we'll do, because we're dealing with forces, and any time you have forces in a problem, it's probably a good bet that you'll have to draw a free body diagram. So we're going to draw a free body diagram just like that. So now we're going to apply the work kinetic energy theorem. We need the free body diagram to look at the forces, to know which forces are aligned with the displacement vector, and to know the value so we can crank out the work. So let's calculate the total work done by each one of these forces. Well, um, it turns out we only have to worry about one of these forces and that is a friction. Um, and we take the force due to friction times the displacement, and of course this is going to be a negative quantity because they're acting in opposite directions, and so um, the friction is actually acting against the object. And we don't have to worry about gravity and the normal force at all because the work contributed by those is absolutely nothing because the object isn't moving in those directions. It's moving horizontally, not up and down. So now let's go ahead and use our work kinetic energy theorem equation to solve for the distance. So we're going to plug into the left side and the right side. We calculated the network, so we'll plug in the left side. And we'll 
crank out the change in kinetic energy on the right side. And if we plug in, if we've got negative 30 times d equals, as you can see, the change in kinetic energy from, remember, we've got to go from the final to the initial. So we're starting at 2 meters, we're ending at 2 meters per second, and we started at 4 meters per second. And you'll notice that the left side of the equation is negative right now. And if you look at these, the right side of the equation, that will be negative too. So your negatives will end up canceling, which is good, because we want a positive displacement vector to the right. We've plugged in some numbers, and I'm showing you that the units of these items on the right side are in joules. We have negative 30 times d equals negative 54 joules. Do a little bit of division, and we find out that we've moved 1.8 meters. OK, let's take a look at another scenario. The question is, after the box moves 1 meter, how fast will it be going? Now, in the last problem, it moved 1.8 meters, and it was at 2 meters per second. This is actually moving a shorter distance, so we'd expect the, the velocity uh, to be a little bit higher in this case. We're going to find that unknown velocity. And the first thing, once again, let's draw a free body diagram so we can see our forces that we're going to use to calculate work. So there's our free body diagram, same as before. And we're going to apply the work kinetic energy theorem, calculate the total work. There's only one force acting in the same direction. That's, that's uh, the force due to friction. Um, this time we know the distance, and so we know it's negative 30 joules of work done by friction, uh, none done by gravity, the normal force, because they're perpendicular to the motion. And then let's go ahead and plug these values into the left side of our work kinetic energy equation. And we'll plug into the right side our change in our kinetic energy. We've got negative 30 joules equals 1 half times We've got 9 kilograms times our final velocity squared. That's the unknown that we're trying to find. And we have everything we need to know about the initial velocity. So we know all the information about the initial kinetic energy of the object. If we do a little bit of work, we can uh, plug in some of these numbers, shift things around a little bit, and we can find out that our velocity is 3.06 meters per second. Like we said, we knew in the previous problem that when the box is moving at 2 meters per second, it had traveled 1.8 meters, and so this aligns with our previous answer, the fact that this should be a higher velocity, and sure enough it is. How far will the box slide before it stops? Similar process. So we have a box that um, started at 4, is ending at 0 meters per second, we need to find the distance it traveled. Um, draw a free body diagram first, and there's our free body diagram, same as before, no difference apply the work kinetic energy theorem, calculate the total work, and once again our total work in this case is all friction because our normal force and gravitational force are perpendicular to the motion. And once again we've got our distance is an unknown here so we're leaving that in as our variable. Let's plug into the left side and right side. So we what we have is for the net work done it's negative 30 times d. On the right side we're, we're ending at 0 meters per second or starting at 4 meters per second work out some numbers, and now we've got a total of 72 joules. So the distance it actually travels is actually 2.4 meters, and so our answer is 2.4 meters. Now, let's wax this floor, and let's see how far it goes um, once we wax it. And I stated that the box goes twice as far, so we know our distance that it travels is 4.8 meters, and based on that, can we use that to figure out the coefficient of kinetic friction? Now, on any of the previous problems, we could have done a general solution and plugged in our numbers in the last step, but I used numbers instead right up front, just make it easy on you to see the algebra work out. Let's go ahead and do a, a completely general solution now using only variables. Our goal is to find the coefficient of kinetic friction for the wax floor, and we're going to start just like before. Let's draw a free body diagram. Same free body diagram. This time there are no values, so I'm, we'll wait till the end to plug in numbers. Uh, we've got our free body diagram. Let's apply the equation that relates to the situation. So we've got the network done as a change of kinetic energy. And the network done is done only by friction again. And I'm plugging into the left and right side here. So I've got the force of friction times the distance, which is going to be negative because we're going, these, these two vectors are opposing, equals uh, our kinetic energy in the final situation minus the initial, of course. Our final velocity is zero, so we're going to be able to zero out that the uh, v4. And I'll hold off on a second to do that. Now you notice what I've done here is I've replaced force due to friction, as we've done with all the other work with free body diagrams, equals mu kfn. So I've made that substitution. And of course, we know that fn is the same thing as fg, 
And we know that FG is MG. So for FN, I can just replace FN with MG. Um, this is a nice little relationship which has all of our knowns in it. I know what the mass is. I know what gravity is. I know what the distance is. I know what the mass is. I know what the initial uh, the initial velocity is at 4 meters per second. The final velocity is at 0 meters per second. So you could plug in numbers right now, but I'm going to go ahead and let's notice a couple things here. First of all, mass cancels out everywhere, which means that mass doesn't really matter for this problem. And you would never know that unless you worked out a general solution. Remember, mass only sometimes cancels out everywhere in an equation, so don't just assume for every single problem that mass doesn't matter. In this particular case, mass has no influence, so I could triple the mass of the box and it would still do the same thing. So if we actually go ahead and solve for mass, and remember, our V4 is zero, so that, that's an easy zeroing situation. And if you crank out these numbers a little bit, and I actually solve for mu k, um, just divide it out by um, negative gd, and I come up with a nice answer of 0 0.167 or 1.6 for the mu for the wax floor. We had some conclusions about work. Just Let's just add one more at the bottom of this. You can go back to your note page and add this. That we can use the work kinetic energy theorem to find the final velocity instead of using motion equations. But the one thing we lose by using the work kinetic energy theorem is that it doesn't give us any information about time, like we had time in our formulas for the motion equations. So um, in many cases, though, you'll find that using work and energy to calculate velocities is, is a little bit quicker and easier than it is using uh, the motion equations. So keep that in mind, when you're, especially if you're working on a short answer problem where you don't need the time. For homework, what I need you to do for homework is I gave you a series of three problems where you have a box that's being lifted um, and read, read these carefully and I need you to calculate the work done by you lifting the box I need you to do the work done um, by gravity and caref careful with your signs on these things sometimes the signs will be positive sometimes they'll be negative you'll calculate the total work done and then I also want you to use motion equations, use the old-fashioned motion equations, and use your free body diagram with your acceleration to figure out what your final velocity is and, your, and compare it to your initial velocity and calculate the kinetic energy. After you're done with these three scenarios, one of the scenarios, the first one is constant velocity, the second one is accelerating, the third one is decelerating, you should fill in all of your answers for the calculations you've done. And then I want you to come up with some conclusions here. You're going to see some patterns here. If the network is positive, something happens. If the network is negative, uh, something happens. And if you have zero network, something else happens. And, the, and you can answer these questions as well. And we'll go through these in class to see how you did. The second homework for you to work on related to this concept of work and the work kinetic energy principle is to look at this problem. And what you have is an elevator that's going up from the first floor up to the tenth floor. And it has to make a couple stops along the way here. And so please read this carefully and work through it. And what you're going to do is after you answer some questions here to help straighten out what's going on with the problem, um, I'm going to ask you to draw a free body diagram for the elevator in each case. You'll need that to do your work calculations. Um, I also ask you a little side question about a person in the car um, what force, normal force, would they feel acting against them um, as you're traveling up? But that's not related to the general problem of the card moving up, but just as a little side note to keep in mind, something happens to you in, in an interesting sense while you're moving in these different situations. I've provided a worksheet for you to show um, your work for each one of these scenarios in. So please show all of your work for your calculations in these sections. And once again, I've given you a table to fill out which summarizes what has happened and you'll see, you should see the same patterns you saw on the previous homework problem.